Does the idea of building a business worth millions that leaves you as the founder broke seem unfair? Or as Kanye eloquently put it, win the Super Bowl and drive off in a Hyundai? On today's episode of the Startup Therapy Podcast, we'll explore why building something of great value doesn't directly or immediately turn into value for us as founders. Welcome back to another episode of Startup Therapy from Startups.com. This is Ryan Rutan, joined as always by my partner and CEO of Startups.com, Will Schroeder. Will, we're going to talk about what it's like to be worth millions and billions and trillions on paper and still not be able to pay your mortgage, right? And and this is probably a more familiar story than we'd like to believe, but... uh, (laughs) Yeah, I know you got some you got some stories, man. We both have friends that have been through this. Uh, we've, we've seen this firsthand. So what's the deal, man? Why, why, why can't well, we reconcile think, fake money and real money? Well, <laughs> I think part of the challenge is that we have this notion that once the startup becomes worth something, that some of that money turns into liquidity. And I've seen so many instances where founders have gone through the entire development process and evolution process of their business. And yet five, six, seven years later, when they're supposed to be reaping the benefit of the largesse of this business, they're broke. Yeah. (laughs) And and nobody seems to understand this, but I'll give you a couple case in point. I I can't reveal names, but, but again, uh, you'll have to bear with me on, on the state of of these different businesses. So the biggest example I can think of, which is a couple of years ago, I'm having lunch with a friend of mine and he's walking me through the new offices of their massive company. And it's a business all of you have heard of. You've certainly used their products. And at the time, it was worth about $4 billion. And he's walking me through their executive cafeteria. I mean, they're big enough at this point that they have an executive cafeteria. (laughs) The entire company's meals are paid for, which isn't that unusual for SF-based company that's you know venture funded. And things are going great on paper. <laughs> and so, so we sit down with our company bought meal and he starts explaining that he's going to get married in a few months. And he's terrified because even though he's a co-founder of the company, the company's worth $4 billion, he doesn't have enough money to pay for this tiny wedding. (laughs) He's basically broke. And I'm just sitting there, (laughs) we're laughing about it, although it's not that funny in his case, saying everybody here gets to eat for free, but I can barely afford to eat myself. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) We're going to hold the reception in the the executive cafe uh, where all the meals (laughs) will be paid for. (laughs) The only place we can pay for it. I'll I'll give you another example. I'll just kind of give you some, some points of reference. Another friend of mine, this one based in Los Angeles, he and I are sitting down. He's the founder of a company that uh, was doing about 80 million in revenue. So uh, it was a venture funded company doing extremely well. And and he really built an amazing company. But at the same time, he didn't have enough money to be able to afford a house. Now, granted, a house in Los Angeles is pretty expensive, but that wasn't really the point. He wasn't really making any money. Yeah, He was making a salary, but it didn't make up for the fact that he hadn't made any money uh, you know, leading up to the business, getting venture funded, et cetera, for like seven years. That's exactly right? it, right? So, you might be making even an okay salary now. It's probably okay enough to at least keep up with the the minimum payments on the debt you accrued over the last five to seven years, right? So the, the salary does not make up for, um, at least not immediately make up for that deficit. And that's that can be a, a really tough one to swallow. You know, I experienced this the first time myself when I'd started my first business and the business started to do really well. And I went to the bank and I was trying to buy my first house. And this was in Columbus, Ohio, back in the 90s. I mean, houses cost a lot less than they do now. But even still, I remember going to the bank and any business owner that's listening to this, that's tried this, is <laughs> this is going to sound like a very <laughs> yeah. familiar tale. And I sit down at the bank and I'm excited, by the way, I'm excited by the fact that I finally I'm making some money and, you know, I've, I've got some wealth and what have you. And I sit down with my banker and I'm trying to explain that I want to buy this house. It was one hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars. This was, was not this was not the Playboy Mansion. It was just a standard three bedroom yeah. house. And I remember she sits across from me and she says, wonderful. 
all we need are your W-2s and your bank statements, your personal bank statements. And I was like, well, I don't really have W-2s because I'm a owner in the business and I take distributions and she starts to grumble. Uh And I said, and my personal bank balance isn't that much because I put all of my money into the business. The business has money. (laughs) And she looks at me, she's like, I'm afraid we can't help you. And I'm thinking to myself, the business is making millions of dollars. (laughs) Everyone else at the company is getting a salary on W-2. They can afford to buy this house. I'm the owner. (laughs) And (laughs) I I can't afford to buy this house. Yeah. And not much has changed since then. And so we get this very common theme, Ryan, where all of these startups, all of these founders, even if we get to the point where our startup is worth millions, we have no liquidity. We have no ability to buy stuff. And it is maddening. All right. So you're sitting down across from your banker and, and she's saying you're worth nothing or they can't lend you money. Uh, but but what about your investors? They're telling you you're worth you're worth millions, Will. Yeah, they're saying that asset is worth millions. That, you know, w- there's a difference. In, in, but we always say there's no <laughs> separation between the founder and the company, right? Existentially true. It, financially, not so much. We're in one of the few businesses where we can be told we have millions without anybody actually giving us the millions. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like a, an NBA player gets signed to the league and gets millions of dollars. Now, sometimes they'll have a $100 million contract that will extend over a period of years. They don't get all that money up front, but they still get millions of dollars. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's generally and a house so no bought how right hard, away. Yeah, right. No, they have something to show for it. Yeah. We're in this weird, freakish business where we can go years building wealth, and yet we have no way to spend any of that wealth. And if you're a business owner, put it this way, If you're an existing business owner and you've been in business for five years or longer, this is the bane of your existence. Yes. If you're a new business owner and you're about to get into this, this This will will be be. (laughs) the bane of your existence. Yeah. And so, you know, let's talk a little bit today about what those challenges look like, why they exist, and some ways around them, right? And we it's not perfect, but we can kind of demonstrate what some of the ways, the methods of liquidity might look like. Yep. So this is really a challenge of liquidity, right? We're, we're saying that the investors say it's worth millions. And, and you know, of course, we believe what they're saying. Well, we, we see the same thing. Uh, but literally nobody else on the planet sees it the same way. So what, what's the deal here? It's not the case the investors are wrong. Um, and we're talking about future value. But how is it that we can't get any kind of reconciliation between the way an investor sees this and let's say, an underwriter at a bank sees this? Well, it covers a few different areas. The first area we talk about is the fact that investors themselves are all about future value. Often when they're investing and they're valuing a company, the valuation is often based on what the company will be worth. And and part of me saying that isn't that they're not using a present valuation. There's a present valuation and a future valuation. It's also that they don't need it to have liquidity right now. So, Ryan, if you and I have an idea, and this idea is fantastic, it's got a patent around it, it's incredible, and it's absolutely going to have some market value, but we haven't sold it to anyone yet, we haven't created any kind of cash transaction out of it, it's kind of stuck in this weird netherworld of lack of liquidity, and so while we know there's a value, there's no cash coming in for it, so we can't exactly borrow against it. Sure. And I think... That's one aspect where the investor will see an asset as what it can be versus what it is. The second part of it from an investor's standpoint is they can put tons of of cash and money into something that's losing money and be perfectly okay with that. Uber (laughs) being a perfect example, right? Ask your bank (laughs) about that one. Or Tesla being a perfect example. I'd like to to go uh, about $150,000 over the the assessed value. And and by the way, the, the, the neighborhood is tanking right now. Would that be okay? Would you guys want to you guys want to write that loan? <laughs> <laughs> and I think we get caught up in that. Yeah. As the entrepreneur in a world where everyone around us can see future value, a bank doesn't give a shit. No. You know, I learned this a while back. I actually joined the board of a what's now a public bank. I think we were about to get bought by a public company at the time. And I spent 3 years on the board. 
essentially reviewing commercial loans, which is kind of a big part of the, the process, and understanding how banks think. And at the end of that three-year process, here's what I came away with. I don't understand how banks lend to anyone. <laughs> right. <laughs> I started to learn how little banks made and what their margin of error needs to be. I was not only unsurprised when they said no to me, I was surprised that they could say yes to anybody anyone. in the commercial lending business because yeah. <laughs> yeah. it makes no sense. But from a bank's perspective, as a bank, I don't care how much this thing might be worth in the future. All I care about is if things go sideways, and they will, how do I get my money back? Yeah. Like for anybody who's ever tried to fire sale a startup company, it doesn't go well. It doesn't go well at all. And that's for well. the founder who can tell the best possible story, right? Imagine a <laughs> bank holding this going like, um, uh, well, it's a, it's a, uh, here's the pitch. Like, I, they, don't, they don't even know how to explain it, right? They wouldn't even be able to begin to show the value of that company, nor would they be able to extract any from it. So it's totally understandable. Not the right kind of asset a for them. A startup is not a commoditized asset. Correct. Commoditized assets that the bank knows how to sell if things go sideways are homes, cars, and land. Yep. Short of that, <laughs> your startup could be doing $10 million a year in revenue. But as far as the bank's concerned, if things go sideways, the bank's not a private equity company. They're not going to come in and run the sure. asset. The bank doesn't know how to sell your asset. If things go sideways, the bank is just going to watch all of it go away. That's right. And so when the lender on my mortgage was looking at me, and mind you, mortgages in particular have very strict underwriting rules, especially now. When the lady, the underwriter was looking at my mortgage, what she was saying is, look, we have one way of looking at the world. We look for W-2s and we look for collateralized assets. If you don't have those, that ended well. We don't really. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking about the time in which you were talking about doing this, Will. And the irony is that you, me, and other business owners were probably the only, only people in the United States at that time who weren't getting loans. I mean, they were just like, if you could fog a mirror, you could get a loan at that point, right? You yeah. walk through the door yeah. and and stand upright long enough to sit in line to uh, to, to sit down with an underwriter, you were probably going to get a loan. What was it? The ninja loans from yes. Arrested Development, the yes. no income, no job <laughs> application? <Yes. laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, well, in in so what I learned in that process was the value, the asset value of my business as a bank would see it. Now, mind you, there are other folks that you can turn to and we'll talk about those. But as a bank would see it was damn near zero. The funny thing, if I turned around and got a job at my company and I wasn't the owner anymore, I'd be good to go. Yep. <laughs> I'd get right. up on the roof, no problem. And I'm thinking to myself, it, but... I'm the one who controls that money. Wouldn't I be more capable than anyone else at that company of ensuring that that, that W-2 gets paid? Yeah. Nope. No. <laughs> not, not at all. Too much logic there. Uh, too much logic there. Too much logic. And in all, in all fairness, it's also how they ensure some consistency in the process. It's also how some of that underwriting gets backed in general. So I understand why it exists. It's just kind of hilarious it how is. it works. So if you've, if you've ever been a an independent contractor of any sort, anyone in a 1099 or distributed income capacity trying to apply for any sort of credit, it's a total nightmare. It's just banks don't understand it. But you have to ask. There has to be someone that understands this business, right? There, right. <laughs> there has to be someone that can look at your business and say, you're making $5 million a year. I have to be able to lend against that in some capacity. Which brings us to outlet number two. And that would be some sort of revenue-based financing. Yep. Factor now, financing, merchant cash advance, and yeah, yeah they exist. Now, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, like, I like the I'm yeah, like this is gonna, yeah. I'm I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to ease into this with best of intentions here. I have a handful of friends, founder friends, who have started business in the revenue-based financing industry, and they're good people. However, at which point you're going to a revenue-based financing model, as far as a, an entrepreneur or a business, is yeah. usually not your first stop. If nope. these guys had 
if these guys had store frontage, they would be in a strip mall next to a nail salon, yes. <laughs> a pawnbroker. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's they might be sharing not your space first place with the pawnbroker, to, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably. But let's at least talk about what it is and, and why folks go there. It's, it's not that we're not recommending it. We're just saying it's probably not your first place to go. Uh, the way these folks work is they look at what your receivables are. Mostly the consistency of those receivables. If you have really lumpy receivables, if one month it's really high, another month it's really low, et cetera, they're going to get a little concerned about that. But if they can see that you have consistent receivables, all they're going to do is lend you some money and use those receivables as the collateral. Yep. In most cases, they're going to lock those receivables. So the money actually goes to their bank first to ensure payment and then to you. Yep. Not surprisingly, these often come with extraordinarily high and egregious terms. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm not sure on, why. Yeah. 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 That's the other side of it, right? And, and I guess the, the, the reason why is because you don't have other good options, right? And, and so therefore, they can, they can retain that chokehold on the rate. But the, the other side of this is that for anybody who's really, you know, if you're listening to this right now and you're saying like, you know, I need some liquidity as, as the owner, um, this, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm going through my, my mental database here trying to think of anybody I know that's used this type of funding for, for liquidity at the, at the founder level. I know plenty, plenty, plenty of people that have done this to, you know, create some cash flow um, in order to, you know, service a larger client or, or buy more inventory, things like that. But I don't know anybody that's used this for founder liquidity. And, and part of that would just be the terms that come with it are fairly egregious. And often you need, you're, you're leveraging this, right? You're going to use the money from this to leverage it up into additional revenue. So therefore, you know, it would need to be spending it on things that are directly associated with cost of goods sold or something. Do you have examples where anybody's used this as, as liquidity? Well, usually in businesses, let's say that aren't venture funded, I have to point out that if you have investors involved or you're venture funded, this isn't even close to an option. Yeah. As we've talked about in past episodes, the moment you have other folks in your cap table, particularly investors, they have no interest. They don't, they don't care about your personal liquidity. I'm not pointing them as bad people, I'm just saying they invested it in the business under the terms that you were broke. Yep. And they're generally okay with you sticking to those terms. You know, that's what you signed up for. And therefore, you it's your broke, problem. You can end broke. We'll both get liquidity yeah. together. It'll feel that much better, guys, if we all get liquid at the <laughs> same time. And Ryan, I hate to say this, but I've heard different investors tell me point blank that they don't actually have a problem with the founder being broken hungry because they feel like that's more motivation. Oh man. Said differently. Yeah. Well, I've had I've he, had that he, argument before too. Well, you know, I've gone out and I've tried to raise for businesses uh after I'd done a couple businesses beforehand. And what I mean by that is I had made some money, so I didn't need the money personally. I was able to go without a salary and you know have a little more flexibility. Yep. And I had more than a few investors tell me flat out that that is actually a red flag for them. They said that if it doesn't look like you're hungry for the money, then our investment isn't as safe. Yeah. You know, the I, hey, that's in the their game thesis. argument. Like, yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, some merit to it. I, okay. Kill me not to point this out. Mr. Investor, particularly VC, let me just make sure we're saying the same thing. You want to make sure that I have skin in the game to make sure your investment works, but you're raising a fund using other people's money, uh -huh. taking a total of nearly 20% of that fund yeah. off the table to pay your mortgage to uh -huh. make sure none of your bills are missed. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a little gated to this process, are you? A little, little upset? Oh my gosh. I, mean, I just, I, I, come on, man. If you're going to, if you're going to make that argument, make the full size of the argument, let's talk about how we both feel, not just how. Yeah. <laughs> I've said I, this yeah. uh, quite frequently that hypocrisy is my least favorite flavor of ice cream, right? It's, and it's, <laughs> it, it's rife. But I get it. Like at the end of the day, they're making investments. You know, they, they can have whatever thesis they want because it's their checkbook. The yeah. point is, there is no part of the investor mindset where they're saying, boy, Ryan, I understand you've had a tough go of it. Let's just give you some extra money to make sure you're doing okay. <laughs> yeah. No one cares how broke no. you are. That is your problem. And it's gonna it's gonna continue to be your problem for a very long time. Where that gets particularly challenging for us though is when the startup starts to go longer and longer and i'm talking about 
four, five, six, seven years and more, at which point a lot of founders are going to start to go through very different epochs in their life. They're going to start families. They're going to need to buy their first house. They're going to have real life events that maybe they were in their 20s and they could get around those. But now they're in this weird place and it happens a lot, way more than you ever hear about, where I'm 32 years old, let's say, and let's say I started the business fairly young. And I've been at this for seven years. I make $175,000 in a salary, which, which is a lot of money. I'm not debating the amount of money. But hey, man, for the first four years, I made no money. And yes. all I did was rack up debt, a lot of debt. Then I made, you know, the first year we were seed funded, I made 75000 And then as we got a little more money, I made 125000 I make 175000 but I haven't been making 175000 for seven years. Correct. I've been doing nothing but cranking up my debt. So my net take home with all that debt is more like $100,000, which doesn't mean I'm starving. But if you look at what the value of the business is, maybe the business is worth $75, $100 million now, and I don't have enough money that I can even buy a house, a cheap house, much less any house, that starts to grind on you a bit. Sure. And it's really it doesn't consistent. seem fair. There's another version of this, and let me try to point this out. You didn't take on money. You're running, let's say, a services business, and you've been running it for six or seven years. Business is doing pretty well. Business is doing $5 million a year, which is reasonable revenue. You're doing about $300,000 a year in profit, so you're making pretty good money. But you go to the bank, and you say, hey, I want to buy that house, or I want to even finance a car. And they look at you, and as far as they're concerned, you have almost no revenue, Yep. right? And you're, you're scratching your head. I don't understand. I went from zero to $5 million of revenue. And yet I can't buy a car. Yet anyone that works for me can. You know, anybody, my, my peers who are making half the amount of money I am can easily yeah. get this finance. Walk on the lot it, get again. And drive away. Yep. I'm considered broke. So what a lot of folks are thinking is, how is it that I can, I can build such an incredible asset and it seems to work the least for me unless I sell it? right? Unless I either sell it and or IPO it, et cetera. And the truth is, this is kind of how it works. It's frustrating as hell, Yeah, but but it's kind of how it works. And so a lot of folks are trying to crack this problem in different ways. Some folks are looking at how to do founder liquidity rounds, but we should probably talk about that. But that only works for a small number of people. Right, that, that's that's not yeah, a one size fits sure. all. Uh, that's correct. Kind of thing. Yeah, that's not like there there there's not a storefront for that option. No, and, and there's a, a bunch of folks out there that are trying to do these small private equity shops. And if you're not familiar, these are folks that are looking for businesses that are say five million dollars in revenue and higher. And they'll come in and they'll buy a portion of the company, usually a minority stake, like thirty to forty percent. Yep. And take the uh, take that a lot of that cash and give it toward the founder for some liquidity. But the challenge with that is they actually, they buy for pennies in the dollar. So you're back to the pawn shop model. Yeah. And now you're in bed with a private equity company and you're basically working for them on a go forward basis, right? And and like, that's not the the best thing either. And you've traded a bunch of future value and maybe not because, you know, you, you know, again, you hit these new life milestones where maybe kids are happening, uh, maybe college is happening for kids, who knows? you may have needs at that point where the liquidity then isn't necessarily optional. It's like, ah, I just want to pad my bank account. I just want to feel whole. Um, You may need some of the money, right? Life happens. And in that case, you're now trading a bunch of the future value of your company for pennies in the dollar. And we talked about this in in a previous episode around paying people with equity, right? It's really expensive money. Right. It's a really expensive Absolutely. currency. And so, you know, even if it does provide you with the, the liquidity that you need, the terms are rarely rosy for the founder. Oh, they're brutal because at that point, similar to a pawn shop, you're going to whoever is still willing to pay you for yeah. some of that equity. And it's and it's only people that are that can buy the equity at such a cheap price that there's almost no chance that they can't get back out of it. And so the the idea for a private equity is buy it as low as possible. Pawn shop, buy it as low as possible. So if you sell it for anything, you're going to make money. Well, if if you're the recipient in that transaction, the founder, the guys like us, that's not a very good transaction. No. And unlike a pawn shop, you don't get a ticket. You can't just go buy it back for them 45 days later if you change your mind. No, you can't. And so 
that's a really tough one. So akin to that is the idea that if I raise more money, the investors will allow me to take some money off the table. That Maybe. does happen. But I think, we, I, think I, I think we need to temper some expectations on that one. He, here are all the reasons it can't happen. And, and bear with me here. I'm not trying to be negative about this. I'm just trying to kind of put this in a, in a, a very No, I think consistent, we have to frame this. We have to yeah, yeah, I want to frame this yeah. because I think people hear this. We, we saw that the, the co-founder of WeWork took $700 million off the table so far, and they haven't even gone public yet. You're like, oh my God, there must be so much money out there. Dude, th- there's not. Yeah. The only way those deals happen, and I want to make sure people understand this, is if you are killing it to the point where the people who want to put money in feel like they need to be compelled to offer you money off right. the table to essentially bribe you to take their money That's because right. it's a very competitive deal. Just a caveat to the WeWork one too, because that is also, that's they're growing like crazy. Sure, that business is doing very well. Something else that's very interesting about that business is that it's highly asset backed. And it's one of the asset classes we talked about in the beginning. It's buildings and dirt, right? So right, there's a right, very right. That different very reason, unusual. very secure, right? They're, they're not buying funny money uh, equity in a fast growing startup that could just fall apart tomorrow. There's a shitload of asset behind that company. There is. And there's also something within that. So there's there's two ways. If you're taking off and things are going really well, there's two ways you're likely going to take money off the table. And I caveat all of this by saying, if you're in this position, you know it. <laughs> no one has to let you know. Uh, yep. By this point, <laughs> right. you have so many signs that tell you you can do this. So if let me say this differently. If you're not hearing any of those signs, you're not in that position. <laughs> That's right. So one version is, and your next investment round, as part of the round, you take a little bit of money off the table. They buy some of your stock directly. You take some of that money home. And that's wonderful. And it is, it does happen in funding rounds. It happens more now than it used to do. But it's rare and it's it's sort of reserved for only the most elite of folks in uh, raising money. If right. you are... So a, just, just back up on that number for a second, right? Because the number of people successfully raising money is a tiny percentage of the people that are trying the percentage of the people who are raising funding who fall into the funding elite is a subset of that number. So this is a highly, highly, highly unlikely outcome. We're talking about dozens of companies. Yep. Now, the the problem is those dozens of companies or the article that you saw for WeWork, everyone reads them and they, yep. they don't really understand how pervasive or not per- pervasive that is. And so they get a bad understanding of it. No problem. The second way that folks get liquidity is considered where folks are selling stock in a pre-IPO basis. Again, if you're at this point, it's not like you don't know it, but it's just worth understanding for everyone else. Before Uber went public, they had multiple rounds where insiders, mostly the executives, but some of it trickled down to folks uh, earlier in the cap table or later in the cap table, uh, were able to sell their shares to folks that were looking to buy huge swaths of the stock. Same thing happened with Facebook, et cetera. Now, those... Those transactions do happen, but not until you get to a massive scale. My buddy who I mentioned got to the $4 billion, they're a much bigger company now, has certainly done what they call a secondary transaction where folks have put money in in order to basically buy stock and create like, some liquidity for folks internally. That also rarely happens. And it's usually on path to be able to go public, which is how the people buying that stock are yep. going to get their money back out. Exactly. Right. Once it, once it gets to a stage where inherently it's going to be liquid, for everybody involved, there, there's no real challenge around liquidity anymore, right? Yeah, as the founder is anybody that owns a piece of that, when it goes public, this is no longer a challenge. Right. So you only have a few options as the founder of a business trying to create some liquidity. One option is you can try to use some, some part of your asset to create some sort of revenue-based you know, loan back to yourself. Yep. Not the best option, but it does exist. And and frankly, to be fair to those folks that are out there, I'm seeing a lot more businesses get into this business and trying to come up with non-predatory ways to make this work. Because everyone understands this problem right now, Ryan. Like yeah. Everyone understands that all of these founders and all these businesses exist and this liquidity is zero. There's all this tied up capital and all this tied up value. And when you have those things available, there's plenty of people that are going to try to work a new system to make things a bit more available, a bit more reasonable. Yeah. 
And I got to say, these types of loans aren't just the merchant cash advance predatory folks as far as the name. PayPal offers them. American yeah. Express offers them. I mean, it's it's everywhere because they know they can get paid back. They understand the collateral. But they're often not on great terms for the founders. But I just do have to point out that, that those do exist. Another portion is often to find an investor who just wants to buy a piece of the business. They just want in on the business. And they're willing to use the investment as mostly founder liquidity. That's not uncommon. For example, Ryan, you, have an, you and I have this $5 million business. And we're just looking to take on an investor who wants a portion of the business, but we don't necessarily need their investment capital. Yep. And so person comes in and they say, hey, we'll buy... Uh, I'll put a $250,000 check in order to get a percentage of this business. Ryan, you and I split that and that's it. A really yep. popular example of that happening, that's what Jason Fried and DHH did with Basecamp. Um, yeah, yeah. Of all people, Jeff Bezos came in and gave them a check for at the time to create some founder liquidity for them to be an investor. And DHH actually wrote about this in one of his best articles, uh, something called The Day I Became a Millionaire. And, and yeah. he's talking about what happened when yep. Jeff wrote them the check and what they were able to do with it. It's actually a great article. If you can find it out there, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. But that's an interesting option. But you got to understand, the only people as, in, as investors that are willing to buy into a business is if the business is pretty successful already. Yeah, they're basically buying future cash flows or access to a customer database. There's some, some existing true asset that has real commercial value to them and that's why they do it right and that and that's easy to understand but again it's it puts you in the minority of businesses that have made it to that stage and, and the other side of that is that by the time you've gotten to that stage your need for liquidity may have also uh diminished if you're at a point where somebody's willing to come in and drop that kind of check on you you're probably accelerating it, but you're probably going to make that money anyways, right? At that point, the business is cash flowing. Um, you have the ability to put that money in your pocket. Um, so what you're doing at that point is accelerating it a bit. Because uh, as you said, you don't really, in that instance, you're not taking that money because you need it for the business. The business right. is already doing well. The business is growing under its own steam. You're not taking that cash on to accelerate the business. You're taking that cash on to accelerate your own wealth and basically accelerate that payback period from that time that you put in early on where you're getting paid nothing. Yeah, you fill in the potholes, as I call yeah. it. I mean, all along the way, you were racking up all this debt. Maybe you had student loan debt that never got paid off properly. Sure. Maybe you had credit card debt. Most certainly that didn't get paid off. Any kind of personal loans you took to get there. Yeah, yeah. It wouldn't be uncommon for a founder with a three to $5 million business to be sitting, and it could be any size, but I'm just pointing out, Three to five million dollar business to be sitting on a hundred thousand dollars in personal debt, and I'm not I'm not even talking about car loans and and uh, you know mortgages. I'm talking about actual real debt that they own. Well, let's and, let's play that out for just a second because I just want to I just want to point out something an irony here. So yes, that's not a great situation to be in, but you're a hundred thousand dollars in debt and you have a five million dollar business. Put this into context. I don't want to go off on a on a tangent here, but you end up in the same situation with most undergrad degrees now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't have a $5 <laughs> million dollar business. You got a chance to go get a $38,000 job. So maybe that'll make everybody feel a little bit better about their lack of liquidity. <laughs> well, I think, you know, the challenge too is often we have businesses, let's say they're doing five or it could be $10 million and even more, but the businesses aren't necessarily making a lot of money yet. Yeah. And so uh, there's not a lot of, of uh, cash out liquidity. You know, the base camp guys were able to build a business that had a ton of cash out liquidity. So they were in a yes. different boat. But there's a lot of folks, especially early in the business, there's not a lot of distribution liquidity or, or cash out liquidity because you still need all the money that you're earning to put back in the business yep. and then some. Yep. That's that's the gas that continues to run that machine. You bet. But that doesn't necessarily change the the founders' lives. Again, they, they could be getting to a point in their life where uh, they need to buy their first house. They need to be able to pay some of this debt back so they can get on top of their funds for the first time. Mm -hmm. I, I think once this timeline starts to extend, and I'm talking five, seven, sometimes 10 years, the the lifestyle miles that it starts to put on these founders is brutal. Yeah. And, and the issue of non-liquidity starts to become really painful. Yeah. And this is where if we circle back to that, you know, that argument around keeping them hungry with the investors that, you know, you can make a strong case that 
at some point you're not doing yourself any favors by by making the founders live or run too lean. Sometimes there's no options, right? Like, um, and and of course, you know, an investor may not want to throw money at someone just to help improve their lifestyle when they're saying, well, hey, look, improve the business and your lifestyle, improve alongside of it. But you and I both know that healthy, happy, energetic, well-rested, you know, emotionally sound founders tend to do better with their businesses. Yeah, we're talking about the difference between making the, the, the startup hungry versus starving it all together and, and right. being surprised that it lives. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And I don't believe in the fact that a startup founder needs to be broke in order to be uh, viable. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that we all need to have something to work for. But I think there is a point where if you starve the founder too much, the founder's focus becomes 100% focused on survival yeah. and not focused on growth. And I think, exactly it. yeah, because at some point, we can go so long saying, oh, I guess my rent's not paid, my mortgage isn't paid, I guess my bills are stacking up. But at some point, that comes home to you. And yeah, now your spouse sure. is talking about it. You can't move on with your family. Once you're dealing with those problems, I don't think those are healthy ways to grow a business. I don't think those are healthy focus areas. I think they become dangerous focus areas. Yeah. And the long suffering merit badge that you earn, it just isn't worth it, right? Like there's, there's no badge of honor to be had there for suffering and suffering and suffering. Yeah. And I think it's a dangerous tactic for investors to take because I think at which point we've got these distracted founders, they're harder to manage at that point. They're thinking of how to get out of this thing and not necessarily in a way that you're thinking about it, like how we're going to maximize yeah. profits. In looking at lots and lots and lots of businesses that we've coached, some that we've bought, some that we've you know looked at, in looking at all their different situations where they were looking to get to an exit, it wasn't always a hey, I'm just, I'm going to be happy about this until this thing comes to a great end point. For some of these folks are like tired. I just want to get the hell out of this thing and I'll do whatever it yeah. takes to do it. That is not the, the investment you no. want to be sitting <laughs> behind. No, not the we often be hear the on. analogy of, so I was just getting ready to go there. I was just getting ready to say, you know, we often make this analogy of, you know, they don't just bet on the horse, they bet on the jockey and they don't have any, any real concern for the jockey. And that's not always true. You know, you and I both know some, some really great investors who do take personal interest in, in the people they invest in, which there are more of those out there. You hear us investors? Do you hear what we're saying? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's a very valid point that we, you know, there, there would be some merit in, in thinking a little bit more holistically about this. Given the long odds on these things anyways, anything you can do to improve those odds seems like it would be worth uh, at least thinking about making some investment in. So hopefully we'll start to see this change. Yeah, the way I see it is there's nothing we can do to fundamentally change where we stand in the liquidity position. Until we sell the business, we're not going to get liquidity. Until we bring on an investor, we're not going to get liquidity. There's not a lot of options. The only focus that I put in front of all of us as founders is just to keep our heads down, try to push for a faster exit if that's what we're really intending on, and don't think about anything else until we get to that liquidity. That's a wrap for this episode of the Startup Therapy Podcast. This is Ryan Rutan on behalf of my partner, Will Schroeder, and all the Startups.com family thanking you for joining us. And we hope you'll continue to join us. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and comment on iTunes or wherever you love to listen to Startup Therapy. You can find all of our episodes at Startups.com slash podcast. If you're looking for more amazing resources to launch or grow your startup, be sure to head to startups.com and check out Startups Unlimited. It's everything we have to offer from our online university to our amazing community of experts and founders, and even all the tools we've built like BizPlan, Fundable, and LaunchRock. It's everything a founder needs. Visit startups.com slash begin. That's startups.com slash B-E-G-I-N. You'll thank me later. Oh,